come once again to discuss things. It is I, the one, the only. So hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Geeky Gentlemen. I'm Sid Part 2, joining me today is... A geek for fun. And what character are we discussing today? Well, I went back and forth for a bit on which ones I was going to go with. Um, you could say I was on two minds of uh, which one I was thinking. And so I decided, why not embrace that and discuss Harvey Dent Two-Face. Ah, Classic. Okay, so uh, full disclosure, this is the first time I'm hearing him say that. So that's it's actually kind of fun. Um, so Two Face is, is a character that I think has a lot in common with one of my favorite Batman villains, and that's the Riddler. And it, it, by that I mean like he's a really famous Batman villain, but he doesn't have very many good stories in comics. Like, everyone will tell you Long Halloween, and Long Halloween's great. But then there's not a lot out there. There are a couple other stories that I know of that I think are really good. I don't remember... I'm not going to be able to remember all the names of them off the top of my head since I obviously wasn't able to, like, prepare for this. But I do definitely have some stuff that I'm going to recommend by the end. Um, but what's what's your background on Two-Face? Uh, Two-Face has always been one of the Batman villains. Like, I've always been immediately attracted to for some reason um i always like characters who have an implied history to them um basically harvey dent is always integral to two-face the fact that he was batman's ally that nearly in every single adaption he's ever been in he's always been someone who starts off on the forces of good who then falls to villainy which is very unique for a batman villain and normally their origins are already done and then Batman faces them for the first time. Here we have a character who Batman has known in his world for maybe a year at most and normally, but it's still it's a sizable amount of time that builds their friendship. And then seeing his fall and then seeing the recurring encounters immediately has a, a pull to me. So that's what I grasped on uh, grasped onto initially. And then as I've read more of the character, I've developed other reasons why I liked it. But when I was a kid, I was just like, oh my God, he's Batman's friend turned bad. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's interesting because, uh, like I was saying earlier, there's not a lot of great Two-Face stories, but he's one of the characters who's been adapted the best. And I think th the interesting thing in that is most of his best adaptation stuff is adapting the origin because that that is kind of what makes him unique among Batman villains. He doesn't have the distinction of being a super genius on the level that like the Joker or the Riddler are. And I think that's why he doesn't have very many stories in the comics that are, that are like really big grand villain moment kind of things because it just wouldn't fit as well if Harvey Dent was a super genius on the, that same level as the other Batman villains, you know, it just, it doesn't quite work. Um, and then there's there's also like his gimmick stuff where like everything's in twos. Um, I can't remember the name of the comic, but there is this Batman comic where he attacks a television station, and he's got a boa, he's got a, a python with two heads, and he uses he like throws it at someone, and the the python starts eating them. Um, like the heads start fighting over which side <laughs> each one's gonna eat. And I'm like, <laughs> God, that's just like a really complicated crime. Like, where did he steal that from? Someone's collection? Um, that's just, like, so, so like, so the, the gimmick thing has kind of been one of the things that keeps him up. But, like, you know, Joker's got these grand master plans that involve so much manipulation and, like, understanding of the human psyche and, and how people are going to react to certain things. And Riddler's got, you know, this ability to, like, you know, predict people to a T. And Two-Face doesn't really have that because it really wouldn't fit his character as well. Yeah, I feel like he has to he has to come as a threat to Batman from a different level because 
he's not going to be outsmarting him, but the the thing you get the coin and how I like Two Faces, because there's been quite a few attempts at defining what his gimmick is, and nearly every time he appears, it's always got some kind of variation on it, because sometimes it is the two thing, sometimes it is everything like he, he was going to attack the place at two to two or something like that. Like he's he's got that numbers thing, but then some other times it's just like duality, and then other times it's just chance. Mm-hmm. And I always like the idea of Two Face being a threat because he's got two plans, but you don't know which one he's going to execute until the very last second where he flips that coin. And Batman could prepare for both of them. But he doesn't. He can't predict that chance. Mm-hmm. Now let me ask you this: What do you think of, or what's what's your preference with Two Face to have it be legitimately a split personality, like on the level of there, there's a great episode of Batman: Brave and the Bold where Two Face has Batman backed into a corner, and then he flips the coin to decide whether or not to kill him, and it comes up, you know, good side up, so he's not going to do it. And then Batman's like, all right, you take the one on the left, I'll take the one on the right. And then Harvey Dent helps him defeat his own henchmen. Do, do you like where it's like really a completely different personality where they, they do completely different things? Or do you like for it to be, it's still just one psyche. He's just, you know, he's lost all moral compass and now he just leaves everything up to chance. Like a lot of Batman things... I think it entirely depends on the tone you're going for. Because I feel like if you're in a Brave and the Bold type context, if we're doing fun Batman, I think you go all the way like that and you like you make him two separate people and you can have fun with that. But in the general stock, especially nowadays where Batman's in a more darker setting, I kind of prefer like, the, the Take the Dark Knight had where Harvey Dent is a good person but under that he's got his demons and then eventually as he becomes two-faced that becomes the representation of that coming out but at the same time that coming out doesn't mean he's fully not harvey anymore so there's always the chance that depending on the coin he could do good or to do evil but it's not two separate people it's one flawed human i think that's more interesting generally Okay, and and I tend to agree with you, if not for the fact that one of my favorite Two-Face issues completely depends on the the split personality, and it is in, you know, dark, serious Batman uh, setup. Shoot. Um, Okay, so this is in the No Man's Land series, so it requires a little bit more context, which is disappointing because it's, it's one of those things I wish I could just hand to someone, but I do have to give the context for it. Um, so No Man's Land, uh, Gotham City is declared a No Man's Land after an earthquake, and it falls into anarchy where it's being controlled by different rivaling, rivaling, rivaling gang factions, each controlled by a different Gotham supervillain. And Two-Face's gang is controlling, um, territory that's very close to the small patch of territory controlled by the Blue Boys, which is what's left of the GCPD. Um, And so Jim Gordon, early on in the No Man's Land saga, makes a deal with Two-Face in order for, like, mutual protection and stuff, but then he eventually goes back on that deal. And that creates, you know, repercussions, and Harvey kidnaps him, and and, and literally puts him... Two-Face literally puts Jim Gordon on trial for breaking this contract and it's it seems like really big and controversial and everything and batman has to come in and try to you know do anything he can to to get the um get the the get gordon out of the situation and what he says is you can't call this a trial when gordon doesn't have anyone to defend him that's not fair that's not justice and two-face is like all right, no, no, you're right, you're right, fine. Let Gordon pick someone to defend him, anyone. And then they pick Harvey Dent. And so there's this absolutely beautiful page where it's split right down the middle. The The far left panel is the, the Harvey Dent face. The far right panel is the Two-Face face. And then the center is the court transcript as Harvey Dent and Two-Face argue about Gordon's guilt. 
and it is just one of the most comic booky moments ever, but it plays it so straight, and it's such a cool fucking thing, and it just depends entirely, absolutely entirely, on the the idea that it's a completely separate personality. Um, and I just I love that moment so much. I, I remember when I was first reading through No Man's Land, that was still before I like started reading current comics. And that was my first exposure to like that comic book trick of take something that's really, really kooky, play it completely straight, put a ton of drama on it. And it, it's such an effective issue. Um, I absolutely love that scene so much. No, I can see just describing it. It's um, it's one of those things where I do think that's how you, you use that to emphasize why Two-Face stands out because he has that like... A lot of Batman villains are crazy or define as crazy and like have specific disorders you could attribute to them for middling success depending on which one you go with. But Two Face is very clearly easily defined as split personality. And in a comic book medium where you have panels, you can play with that so well. Um, even in film, if they went more creative with it, like I know um, Batman the Animated Series did a good job of shadows with before he even was scarred is they would show how two-face turned into big bad half like his his darker personality before he became two-face by just shadowing part of his face differently so he looks different Mm -hmm. stuff like that is really powerful you can get away with um and i feel like while i do kind of like if i had to write a two-face story so i would probably go with the he's one guy who is left he's he, he's interesting because he's entirely left his moral reasoning down to chance he has no moral compass he's got a coin that does that for him but he's still a rational human being i would maybe say if you were going to do like a straight recurring batman villain like he is two-faced people like to say batman villains like represent him and it's more more so true with two-face as well as he is indeed the encapsulation of how different are bruce wayne and batman and here is a villain that no other villain matches that like he does Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah the the duality of the character and as well as like that fine line of justice kind of thing um there's there's two-face is one of the better reflections of batman because some of them are like are good but they're they're just such a specifically honed aspect but the better ones are are more rounded and like there's there's one particular aspect that jumps out but then there's other things that that begin to reflect uh as as they're defined so like scarecrow is one of the poorer batman reflections in my opinion and that's probably why he's not as much of like a big deal villain because like yeah i mean he's got the the imposing fear thing but that's it's that's about all they have in common whereas two-face and joker and riddler have a lot more things that are hitting um on on uh reflections of batman so yeah i I can totally see that um do you have uh like a a, let's talk aesthetics for a minute here do you have a preferred look for two-face because he's he's one of those things that i think artists tend to have a bit more fun with him you know yeah, and I, I, that's something I like about the character is I if I feel like it's right and not, you don't have to keep it consistent. I think it's fun to let artists and colorists play with what even color is, different side of his face is, what they want to do with it. But just my personal preference of what I think makes the most sense and what I think looks the coolest is I like it when he's like a burn victim, but not like he's mutated. Mm-hmm. No, I, I tend to agree with that. Um... It, it does have such a cool look to it. So you got, like, your Dark Knight, and you got your uh, your Arkham City did the, like, clearly it's it's a very bad burn. Um, those tend to be good. I do like the just, what the hell happened to him? Like, it's not even acid that got poured on him. It's just, you know, comic book chemical that got poured on him. <laughs> Top um, comic book chemical TM. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, that, that shit just, where it's just, like, his eye gets bigger and and like his lips like puff out and and do like weird shit and like his it it makes his hair go crazy too like that's that's the thing that i think you lose the most when he when you go burn victim is you lose the ability to have two-face either just have crazy hair that's like miscolored because of the chemical interaction or for two-face to be able to stylize his hair you know yeah like, I that's, can feel that. 
that's something I like where it's like, you know, the Harvey Dent side is, is pretty typical, like bowl cut almost. And then the other side's like punk rock. Um, that shit can get kind of fun. Um, it is something I feel like not just the face, but I appreciate it as well as you think it would be so limited given what they do, but there have been quite a few creative takes on half white suit, half black suit, or not even just sticking to that, just like half suit good, half suit bad. And like Arkham City did a neat thing where half the suit is like literally burnt and ripped and then the other half is like completely pristine. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, remember, I like it when it's like pinstripes and stuff like that. It's like a mobster's outfit and it's just the color, but you could like two faces as a character whose design invites artists going wild with it. No, totally. And like one of the things I really liked about the Dark Knight is they did the the half suit in a really, really subtle way. Um, like I remember seeing someone talk about that and like, oh my god, he what he what he went and stitched together two suits just to to work with the dynamic. This isn't realistic like it sets itself up to be. But I'm like, no, no, no. He's wearing the same suit that he was caught on fire in. It's it's just that side of the suit's now all burnt up and shit. So it looks completely different. And I love that. That It's such a little tiny detail. The Dark Knight has has that, and then there's another detail with Two-Face that, like, I only caught it because I thought it was, like, a pretty typical film thing that would annoy me normally. So, like, when Batman's beating the shit out of the Joker and asking, uh, you know, where is she? Where, where are they? Um, Joker ends up giving him two addresses. And the address that he says that Rachel's at is 250 52nd Street. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Took me a while to get that, man. <laughs> Damn. I've watched that movie countless fucking times, and I never picked that up. I know, it's absolutely ridiculous. The other funny thing about it is the other address he gives is Avenue X at Cicero, and that refers to a Roman general, and an X is obviously a crossing point. Um, so that's it's really funny that they snuck all that character detail just into the fucking addresses. Um, yeah, that's, that's what, that one, you blink and you miss it. Uh, it's, it's so, you're just so used to, like, fake movie addresses and telephone numbers, you know, your 555s. And it just, it works so well because of that. It's great. <laughs> um. I guess um, something I'm interested to ask you about, because the Two-Face aesthetic is one thing, but how involved do you like Harvey to be with Bruce and Batman before he becomes Two-Face? Because like stuff like Scott Snyder did All-Star Batman, it's like, they were like childhood friends and stuff. Like some people go that far, but and then you got Love Halloween. <laughs> When it's just like that, he's just a detective. Like, what's your preference there? I am tired of Bruce Wayne being childhood friends with everyone in the fucking DC universe. <laughs> I am sick of it. It's so lazy. I, you didn't even have to tell me it was Scott Snyder, and I would have thought thought that was bad writing. Um. So no, I don't like that. Um, I do. I I tend to go with the long Halloween thing. Um, I, what what I particularly like is like. You know, if you read year one as literally the first year of Batman and then you read Long Halloween as like year two, it really works because like year one has that moment where Gordon's convinced it's Harvey Dent who's Batman and he goes to, you know, kind of question him about it and Harvey plays it cool and everything says, no, I'm not Batman. And then Gordon leaves and you see that Batman's hiding under, under Harvey's desk at the time. So, like, they're, they're kind of working together, kind of behind Gordon's back before Gordon's even involved. And then you get to Long Halloween and, you know, everything goes wrong for that whole relationship. And, and you even get that moment that is that's directly mirrored in The Dark Knight with Gordon, Harvey, and Batman standing on the rooftop discussing how far they want to go. Matter of fact, in the, um, in the original script for Dark Knight... Uh, there was a line that just got missed because they they decided not to use the take for it or whatever um, that is directly from the the long Halloween and it's uh you know I'll agree to bend, bend the rules but not to break them and that's Harvey's line and what's funny about it is later on in the dark night that that line has a callback that also got cut um, you know you thought you could bend the rules without them breaking uh, it's it's right in there so it's kind of cool. 
um, that unfortunately just got missed. But uh, yeah, the Long Halloween's relationship with the that that particular triad, I really like. So I do, I like for him to be involved for at least you know, at least the first year uh, or somewhere in there. Um, I guess I don't know if I want to go with the Miller approach of he's he's cozier with Harvey than he is with Gordon the first. I don't know if I'd go that far with it. I feel like that works a bit because it immediately it immediately gives a reason for Batman to have a completely different interaction with Two Face than he does with other villains. Because when he's going against the Joker, like the Batman like hates the Joker more than anything can like on Earth. Like he was going there to stop him, end of day, and he's like every bone in his body is telling him just kill him this time, just end it, and he's like N- I can't. With Two Face, he's never ever going through that. He's always got the, even in the versions where they're not particularly close, he's always got, this was a good man that I let down because I couldn't save him. This was someone who could help Gotham in a way I couldn't. And look what Gotham turned him into. It's it's a very bleak story for a superhero narrative, but what I think works for Batman specifically, because it shows you, specifically early on, it can't be something that happens late in Batman's career. It has to be early on because it immediately oh, yeah. sets a stage this is what this job can do to you. This is how hard it's going to be. Are you ready for this? Mm-hmm. No, I, I completely agree with that. Um, if you do Two-Face late in the career, it's it's almost pointless. Um, it, to be fair, though, I need to watch it. I still haven't seen the second Adam West animated movie where they, they got William Shatner to play Two-Face. I need to check that one out. because Oh, it's pretty great. Yeah, and that is late career, though, right? Like, just yeah. out of necessity, they had to. So I, I wonder how it'll work there. But um, that that one does look kind of kind of interesting but yeah I, I tend to agree you really should only do it uh late career or, or early career i mean um hmm what else can we talk about with two-face real quick um, the one thing that i think is interesting that i don't know how you feel about this but it's kind of become an unapparent trend and i'm kind of i'm kind of with it is uh two-face is slowly becoming and like in specifically the media the most like out of all the Batman Rose Gallery, he's the one that's the most against... Like, Dick Grayson fights him the most. Hmm. And I think that's interesting, that he's a Robin villain. And I think that has a lot that can work with that. Like, even more so... Because Bruce is always trying to help him, so his encounters always have that kind of tinge. But in talking to straight villain, he fights Dick Grayson a lot. Well, didn't... What is it, what is it year three, where it's, um, it's because of Two-Face that the Graysons die? No, it's in year three, um, Tim Drake and is like, that's that's how Tim Cape becomes Robin because like that ha- lonely place of dying happens like right after year three. So maybe that's where you get in like a bit mixed up. But Tim Drake is like fights Two-Face in that. Uh, Batman Forever is when uh, Two-Face kills the Robins family. Yeah, but I thought that was directly pulling from a comic. No, it's always Tony Zuko in the comics. Okay, uh, I like I knew that Tony Zuko was like the golden age, but I thought like in the Bronze Age or something they'd retconned it and had Two Face be responsible for it. Um, no, 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 no. Okay, interesting. Um, yeah, I don't know. Like, and is is he? You read more Robin stuff than I do. Is he just a Nightwing villain or is he just a Robin villain? He's mostly just a Robin villain. Like so, when like he- any Robin. Any Robin and um, like in I don't know if you ever read Robin Year One, Mm-mm. but that's he's uh, when Robin is trying to prove himself on patrol. He can, can you do me a favor and say which Robin you mean as opposed to just Robin? Uh, Dick Grayson. <laughs> when Dick Grayson is on patrol for the first time, like this is like set like Batman's in his third year. His first supervillain he fights is Two Face, and he messes up on the coin choice. Because he doesn't, and he doesn't fully grasp the situation at hand, and someone dies, and then Batman is like just chained up and has to watch Two Face beat the shit out of Dick Grace on his first mission, and then he immediately fires him. And then the whole book of that story of that book is him trying to prove, okay, I messed up, but I can learn from it. You, Robin is an idea that can work, and Two Face goes against that because obviously the whole duality thing and the dynamic duo, but also because of how corrupted he is, he's very good at showing 
Robin is Batman's attempt at showing how he can inspire people in Gotham, where Two-Face is very much his how Batman could fuck things up in Gotham. And having those two face off each other with Dick Grayson, I think is very interesting. No, I agree. I think that's that's a great way to play up the character. And it, it plays to the character's strengths, because, again, he doesn't have... It's just not in character for him to be a super genius like Riddler and, and Joker. It just it doesn't work because, you know, Joker's got the ambiguous background. Riddler's got, like, he would be a billionaire if he just could not be half as petty. Um, you know, there's there's all these things going for these guys. They're, they really are geniuses, and yet they've just turned to supervillainy. Um but that doesn't work for Two Face. So to to play on the duality, to play on the the failure of Batman, and and to play that against Robin, which is essentially you know Batman done right, um, I think that that is a really good direction to go with for the character. Um, okay. one thing we were talking about a little earlier, you made me think of it, then I forgot it, and I remembered it again. Uh, is the whole idea of, of Batman trying legitimately to save Harvey every time. And, and something that, that we've often done with Harvey is, you know, I get so sick of, we've cured the Joker and we're just letting him out of Arkham Asylum uh, stories. <laughs> the one I never get tired of with that is Harvey Dent, though. And, you know, we were talking about Miller all last week, but man, I, I gotta give him credit. It's one of the better things I've seen done with Harvey where they... They give him plastic surgery to fix his face, and, you know, he's, he's quote-unquote rehabilitated at that point, and then he gets, he goes even worse, even more off the rails, and when Bruce is able to stop him, he said, yeah, they thought it was so funny, they gave me surgery to fix me. Well, at least now both sides match, and then there's, like, that narration of, of the, the panel of, like, a full messed up face to face, and Bruce saying, and then I see how Harvey sees himself. Where and that's like a really interesting idea. That's it's literally contradicts everything I think that's ever been done with the character. But the idea that Harvey Dent sees the messed up side of his face as the good side because that's like the side that didn't turn away when when faced with acid from a criminal. That's the side that that took a hit for for the law. And the, the selfish, uh, you know, evil side is the side that turned away. I I really, really like the idea that creates. It contradicts literally everything. <laughs> I never, I have never viewed it that way. Um, yeah. But I'm curious, my take on it has always been that by removing that thing in his mirror, that he can look at his darkness and see it on his half of his face, that kind of kept it in check. And then when he fixed it, it just became him. That's how I kind of took it. But how you mentioned it, like he didn't turn away from justice. That's really good, actually. <laughs> yeah, I think it works both ways and, and might even work like in tandem with each other. But um, I that's how I interpret it. And it, it's like, it's such a Miller thing, right? Where it's just like one line out of context, but it has so much weight. <laughs> um, uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. But that's that's how I always interpreted that moment. And it's it's so letting Harvey go... I love it every time. I, I literally do. Even in Hush, it's bad, but I love it. <laughs> One of my favorite versions of that. I don't know if you ever checked out um, Batman Black and White. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's an issue in that. Um, there's even a Notion comic version of it on YouTube on the DC channel, which is fantastic. And it's like done in the Batman animated series style by Bruce Tim. I think it's written by Paul Dini. Um, and Two-Face gets cured in that as well. Like they fix his face up and he, he gets re- re- rehabilitated by his nurse, who he falls in love with. And eventually they go through a thing and they fall in love, get married. But eventually he finds out that she's got a twin sister and it kind of like, triggers him a bit he's like how i you didn't tell me this this is this is obviously something that's gonna act, make me think of two-face and she's like that's precisely why i didn't tell you because they would never let us be together and they kind of work it out but it's always nagging on the back of his time and then his her sister is like very flirtatious and very i want what she wants i want it to take away everything she's like the bad sister kind of type eventually harvey ends up cheating on the sister with her like a fling but then he tries to redeem it and run away and it's like this whole love drama thing 
the sister goes crazy because she's like, no, you don't just use me as a one night stand. I want you always. I understand you. I want two face. So she goes and murders her twin sister. Harvey comes, finds her in the rage, gets coal from a fireplace and burns his face again and then meets her at a pier. And then she, the, like the, the, the bad twin sister. And she's just like, we can be together now. This is how I see you. I still think you're beautiful. I want, this was why I was attracted to you the whole time, this inside you. And then they kiss and then Harvey shoots her. And then she's like, and then he's like, well, thank you, but you wanted this, but you took away the one chance I had at being happy. And he just waits for Batman to take him. And it's really fucking, I'm not doing it justice with how well it's done, but like, it's really fucking solid. And like, it's stuff like that which I feel like makes these Tarby Dent gets his face reconstructed constantly, but every time it's fucking poetic as um, anything is so good. Mm-hmm. No, I, I really do like that stuff. It gets, it gets really, really, um, two Face just has that like ultimate tragic Batman villain kind of thing. Like, I love that Batman's rogues gallery for that, where so many of the characters just have like unbelievable tragedy that this is the only way they could have ended up, you know? It's just like nothing ever went right for them in history, and so of course they're they're just this like twisted. Um, I I love that crap. It's so untrue to reality, but it's uh, it's got something else to it that just makes it work right. And um, one thing about that, which I think is interesting, which I want to get your take on. Have you ever read Batman Faces? Maybe. It's um. Ah, forget the guy. He, the, the, he's the artist who did. He's an artist writer, and he did uh, Night of the Monster Men as well. Okay. Um, but it's uh, it's one of the best Batman Two Face stories I've ever read. And it's like a solo, like a novel, graphic novel you can pick up. Uh, and in that, Two Face basically goes around building a gang of like freak shows and like carnival folk, who people who've got like disabilities and like Matt Wagner. Yeah, Matt Wagner. Exactly. There you go. Um, He's got these horrible facial features and stuff, and that's like the the whole story goes into this thing. It's really interesting. But in the end, Batman's chasing him through a carnival, and Two Face's argument throughout the whole book has been: society won't accept us. We that's why we strike out. People look at us and think we're freaks. We can't have lived normal lives because of what we've done. We can't undo it. This is the thing. You can take off your mask, Batman, but I'm stuck with this kind of deal. And he runs into this carnival, and he meets this guy who's got like an elephant man type face, and he's just like cleaning the floors. And Two Face is just like get out of my way let me hide you and thingy and the guy's like oh, i can't i'm i'm gonna be late if i uh, don't finish up here for my wife and the guy's like what and he's like yeah you know i've got two kids that i've got to look after and she stays up all night looking after it. But, you know it's a good living it's a good job and like two faces like freaking out he's like no you're you're a freak you can't have a normal life and he's like yeah i can it's fine and like two face just kind of just breaks down because he's not used to being faced with someone who's even more deformed than he is but it's just a normal guy hmm it's really good. Yeah, I think I read that forever. I think I'm I'm like ninety percent sure I own that. Um, and I've just not read it since the first time I ever picked it up. Um, but that does all sound very familiar to me. I think that might be the one where he attacks the guy with the two headed python. Maybe, um, yeah. It it might be. I'm not gonna be a hundred percent on that. Um That does remind me of one other story, and I guess this will just be the recommendations portion for the character. Um and that is Joker's Asylum Two-Face. That is a s- absolutely fantastically tragic and dark Two-Face story. And the funny thing is, he's barely in the issue. Um, what it is is a guy with almost the exact same uh, deformity as Two-Face comes to visit Harvey in, Ar- in Arkham Asylum. And... He's, it's very much kind of like what you were saying, where it's a guy who's had, who, like, even though he's had this, this terrible physical trauma, still has a good life, still has, like, a loving family and all this stuff. And he goes to, to, like, talk to Harvey to try to, you know, make him realize that just because this horrible thing happened to your body doesn't mean it has to define you as a person, doesn't mean you have to be an evil person because of it. That's all just, you know, that's all just really toxic stuff that society has fed you um and harvey just throws it right back at him just like just ultimate almost nihilistic kind of attacks at this guy telling him that he's worthless and that he he doesn't deserve any family that he's you know the 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 
the injury is a reflection on who he is and what he deserves as a person and all this stuff. Because it's really, it's Harvey talking about himself, but he's just throwing it at this guy who's trying to help him. And the, the stuff Harvey says gets so deep at the guy that it starts to, like, really affect him and his home life and everything. And you start to see the guy's life just spiral out of control and it starts to get really dark. And the, the whole story is narrated by the Joker. And so it's the last couple pages and the Joker says, All right, now here's the moment. Here's the moment, and I want you to go get a coin, because what you got to realize is all of this just depends on chance. So go get yourself a coin and flip it. Will our hero pick up the phone and call his wife and get back together and live happily ever after? Or will he eat this bullet? And then you, you turn, and the last page is four panels split down the middle, making eight, and the, the split is a rotating coin, and on one side, the guy's getting ready to kill himself, and on the other side, he's returning to his wife. And so it all comes down to the chance of the coin about what this guy's fate ends up being after interacting with Harvey Dent. And it's just, oh, it's one of the best comic book endings I've ever read. Yeah, that sounds um, fantastic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Joker's Asylum was a really hit-and-miss series, but when it hit, oh boy. <laughs> um, all righty. So I, I definitely recommend Joker's Asylum, of course, Long Halloween, um, and the the issue of uh, No Man's Land where uh, where Gordon gets all involved with with Two Face and, and Harvey Dent has to defend Gordon against Two Face. It's it's beautiful stuff. Yeah, and I, my ones would just again be Batman Faces, um, probably the best comic book focused solo. You can just pick it up and read it on the go, like the no context needed. Two-Face story I've ever read. Um, I also think Robin Year One is a really good example for him as a, a villain and how he plays off Dick Grayson. And uh, the Batman Black and White issue, which you can just search up on YouTube, which is Black, Batman Black and White, Two-Face, whole voiced animated uh, little short of Two-Face getting rehabilitated and all going wrong, which is fantastic as well. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. All righty, Alfie, thanks very much for, for your pick. That was a fantastic episode, sir. Well, I mean, it, I thought it was a terrible episode, and, like, I, I hate that I chose it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Gimmick's going a little too hard, man. <laughs> <laughs> Until next time, I'm the Philosopher. And I'm a geek for fun. And we are your geeky gentlemen, and we will be discussing things. Mm-hmm.